Thank you, uh, thank you for giving me this other opportunity to present the work here at this very nice program. We have another one. Yeah, I know. I have another, I have another one next week. Then, I, and then I'm leaving. So next year. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I will tell you something I've been thinking about on and off uh, uh, in the last uh, three years, and it's about X-ray lines from dark matter and uh, with some new ideas with uh, some very peculiar testable consequences. As usual, before uh, going into the idea itself, I would like to put the idea into a broader context. The motivation is understanding the composition of 85% of matter in our universe. As far as we know, this could be enough. Okay. Well, we should have a t-shirt of this standard model. Yeah, so uh, the actual yeah, 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 yeah. does. I have one. I have one. So, the yes, it does. The yes, yes. <laughs> very nice t shirt, very beautiful t shirt. Yes, yes. But this one could be even more interesting once we know the t shirt. <laughs> okay, so as far as we know, there is only gravity communicating the two sectors, but uh, most part of the research is trying to figure out what other connection there is between these two sectors. And uh, it depends, of course, on the model, and uh, whatever you put here will be crucial to establish what the best uh, techniques to test and eventually discover the dark matter candidate is. So, a large part of the activity has been focused on uh, motivated candidates. Motivated candidates are uh, new degrees of freedom that are introduced for other reasons to attack big problems in particle physics and not just head off to explain the observed abundance of dark matter. So here are a few examples, and the examples will be useful because one of them will inspire our work. So that's why I want to give this overview. Our key problem. So the key problem as uh, famously supersymmetry and neutralino, but more in general as WIMPs, as dark matter candidates, broadly defined with the mass in this range and the cross-section around the weak scale cross-sections. And the status is that this paradigm is uh, quite challenged by current searches in direct detection. Something would be nice if you put here uh, some sample of uh, SUSY models. Yes, yes. And then you see how no, you can have models filling the gaps, so that'll be okay, but usually it's hard to find, I think. It's hard to find. Um, you have to uh, <laughs> advocate some cancellation such the blind spot uh, Carlos Wagner was talking about last week. But you want to see an animation of the Susie region over like the past like you know, two decades. Because <laughs> it can change it goes down and down and down. But if people who pay attention to that region, it's uh, like the original Susie is actually ruled out. <laughs> but, you know, of course uh, all of these regions there is some theory bias. There is no, no, no. That's why I just report the experimental results because in every theory region there is a bias from the theorist who did that. Okay, so and just Yes, yes, yes. I, am, I, I apologize for, but this is not my figure. This is uh, something. Of course, there is QX tablets here, and then there is QX signals. Uh, I will fix that. I will, I will look for a better version. Oh, okay. No, so there is only one. Ah, so, if you want to. So, Mariano was saying that you should super, super symmetrize the two tablets, ah, yeah, yeah. not just the standard model with one tablet. And of course, it's uh, no, okay, so maybe something worth noticing about this plot is that typical cross-section mediated by a z-exchange with interactions are more or less here, so they're badly excluded. And uh, now we are probably more or less <coughs> typical cross-section mediated by a z-exchange. Okay? Of course, you can uh, say that there is some cancellation, you can say that maybe the leading contribution, the leading only contribution is with leptons or with heavy flavors, so this rate comes actually from a loop, so there are ways to even naturally achieve a consistency with the data, but I would say challenge. Okay, not the student. Those are present now. Those are present now. Right? Yes, one yes. So they are touching already the neutrinos. Yeah, so there is so this is a lot uh, this is a lot plot. So you have uh, some order of magnitude before you get there and it will take more or less ten years. So they will say that there's already one of these lines touching. Oh this one. Oh yeah, here, yes, 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 yes. This is Kimo Anton, yes. Uh, 
uh, yeah, sorry, I, yeah, you know, this is really in the, I define the WIMP in this, in this mass window, so when I think about WIMP, I think more in this white area, of course, because it's still allowed. Yeah. 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 Ye
uh, motivated by 3.5 KB line. And uh, now with uh, my student, Alessandro Ranelli, who was a master student in Padova, and now is a PhD student at CISA in Trieste, we are writing up the material of his master thesis, which is a generalization of uh, this study here. Okay? And we don't know, so the matter is I will give you lots of details about that. So for now, I want to build up some <laughs> expectation, right? So I don't want to reveal all the secrets right now. For now, no spoiler, no spoiler. But for now, I will just say that there is a new framework of dark matter where you get X-ray lines, but the spectrum and the morphology I will show with the mean morphology is different from the one of any other dark matter candidates, which gives you X-ray. Okay? And I will explain how it is different and how we can test. Okay, so a few words about uh, indirect detection. So, of course, uh, the reason why we do indirect detection is we point our telescope toward regions in the sky where there is uh, a large dark matter density. This could be the center of our galaxy or it could be some dwarf galaxy around the Milky Way, not too far away. And then we look for annihilation or decay of uh, dark matter and uh, here I have the example of annihilation, here the example of decay. Of course, decay means that the lifetime is uh, larger than the age of the universe, but it's enough to give you some signals today. And uh, depending on the final state, then you have to shower uh, this, uh, you have to evolve this final state all the way down to stable particles, positrons, electrons, neutrinos, antiprotons, protons, and photons. And then you, that's what you eventually detect. So if you annihilate to a W boson, of course, you don't detect the W on Earth, you detect the decay products of the W. So as anticipated, my talk will focus on X-ray, so photons. Why photons? This is very important for what I'm about to say. Photons, and here I put a happy face, then there will be an also happy face here. Let's start from the good news. Photons carry direction and energy information. So if my telescope receives a photon from that direction, I know it was created over there and not there. This is clearly not the case for uh, example for the positrons because they, uh, they have an electric charge so they get deflected by the magnetic field in the galaxy. Okay? So if I look at the photon there, I know it was produced there. That's a very useful information that we will see. Moreover, energy. If I detect a photon with uh, 3.5 kV, just to say a random number, I know that it was produced with 3.5 kV energy, whatever method is produced this photon. Why? Because there is no significant energy loss in the process. Again, for the positrons, this is very, very different. Why? Because there is synchrotron radiation. So the positrons we detect here on Earth or with satellites are much less energetic than the ones that they were produced, for example, from the matter annihilations. Okay, so these are all good news. Now, the bad news, of course, is that in the sky there are lots of photons, not only coming from dark matter, and really this is a very minor correction to the amount of photons we observe. Most of the photons we observe are actually not coming from dark matter, even if dark matter annihilates to something during photons final state. So here are some spectra. And these are produced for dark matter annihilation, but you can think about dark matter decay. The only difference is the fact that you, in the center of mass energy, dark matter is very relativistic today. So, for example, if the main annihilation channel is uh, to Q, Q bar, to Z, or to W bosons, the spectrum of photons you see here, I call it fissureless. By fissureless, I mean that it doesn't pinpoint some preferred energy scale. Okay, it's quite wide all the way to the kinematical limit of the dark matter mass. So this is the energy in units of the dark matter mass. Now, the situation is different if uh, the annihilation or the decay goes straight to Q photons, like uh, dark matter, dark matter going to gamma gamma. Because you have, at that point, a distinct spectral fissure to look for. Here, focus on the blue lines. So here, there is this continuous, continuous line and the dashed line. These are just lines with different instrumental resolution. Okay? It would be a delta function, of course, in the ideal case when the dark matter is at rest and decays. But you see that this is something good because now we have some uh, spectral feature to look for. And as I mentioned before, the background is a really huge problem. So if we have something like this, it will help our search. Okay? So that's why we will focus on lines. Okay? So this has to go through a box diagram. Uh, 
uh, well, uh, at this level, really, to produce this plot, you don't need to specify that. Of course, the dark matter is neutral, so it cannot be an annihilation mediated by electromagnetism. You can think about an effective operator, dimension sever, chi chi bar, f mu nu, f mu nu, which, of course, has some uh, heavy charge state integrated out, for example, from a box diagram. But yeah. to produce this plot, it's. it's uh, the question is that I think the green line is also called a box. Sorry, the green, the green line is a, a box. Uh, I think it's not referred to the box as the box diagram, but as the box plot. <laughs> so the dark matter annihilates to as a plot. So in this case, the dark matter annihilates to. So I, I will remove the, 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 the caption so we can read. This is chi chi going to phi phi, where phi and phi are two neutral states, and these two decay to gamma gamma. Now, we know that the massive particles decay to gamma gamma as a box. You know, the pion decay to two photons. You have a box. So they refer to that box. And so you see that it's more or less a box. Yeah. I think that time. No, no, the box, uh, I mean the... Okay. Uh, not the Feynman diagram, the, the okay. kinematical distribution. So number of photons as a function of the energy. That's... There are four photons there, right? Four photons. Exactly, exactly. Because you have five phi and each phi goes to two photons. So in this case you have four photons. No, because this phi has a boost. Yeah, but they have... So you have, you have a chi chi, imagine two chi chi yeah, of one chi. TV going to phi phi of mass one GV. Yeah, and the phi have the same energy, right? They have the same energy, but they move in the galactic frame. So the photons you get from the decays are yes. monochromatic in the rest yes. frame of phi. Yes. But then yes. you have to yes. boost back to yes. our frame where you serve. So that's the box. That's the box, okay. Okay, so this is virtual internal gram shroud coming from lions where you have a photon emitted from the internal leg, you see these are all cases where you get this feature. I will focus on lines, okay? I will focus on lines today because they allow us to do a more optimized search, okay? Okay, now here I have a very nice plot. It's really nice and it's not mine. This was done by my friend and colleague, uh, Nicholas Rod, who allowed me to use uh, uh, these, fi these figures. I think it's fantastic and it's a landscape of present and current experiments looking at the photon scanner in the gamma ray and the X ray. Continuous lines are current experiments, dashed lines are future experiments. Here on the horizontal axis you have the energy of the photons, GV, so here it's 1 GV, reference frame, so sub GV, here is KV, here is TV, and so on. And here we have the flux, basically the amount of photons, expansion of the surface and time of observation. And uh, as I mentioned already in my title, my talk will focus on X-ray. So you see that there are already experiments taking the time. We will be discussing about the data we've been taking so far. And uh, these data are taken by these experiments that you see they are complementary covering this region because they have different intervals. And most importantly, there is a scheduled project called Athena which will improve our sensitivity, our, I mean, the, 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 the reach, the amount of photons, the fluxes we can uh, observe in the future. This is the dash line of Athena. And another very important information which you cannot see from this plot, but I'm telling you, uh, the projected energy resolution, so the error of the instrument to reconstruct the energy of the photon, is 2.5 EV. Now, if, you, if, if uh, we think about uh, X-ray line as KV photons, as for example the 3.5 KV, this is per mil resolution. Okay? So, this will be very important because the story I will tell you about, our idea, our mechanism, it's something you can eventually distinguish also thanks to this extreme high precision of future experiments. Just for curiosity, the, uh, the Japanese local survivor. He told me. He told me. Where would that be? So he told me it's in the same region, and uh, I don't know if there will be a new Itomi. I don't remember a follow up in the next year. You know, the, sadly, the, the one. Uh, the one was lost. Lost, uh, yes, he went uh, out of the orbit. But it took some data. Someone told me. It took some data. Yes, it took some data. Yes, it took some data. 
<laughs> and there are papers of people who analyze, but not enough to, to say anything conclusive about the 3.5 years. The resolution, remember? What was the resolution of the I think it's a bit uh, uh, worse than this, but still it was significantly better than the, the current. Uh, the current history. Yeah, that was. We were all very excited because, okay, now we're going to know that. Uh, but anyway. Uh, the satellite, uh, I think what, there was some problem. What was the problem? Some measurements, some conversion of units? Or was oh, again? No, the satellite with the Mars mission? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> for the, the reason why it got lost? For the Tommy, remember to know? No, I don't know why. It was why. hit by something. Like, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, but it was some part of space debris. Well, what I think was that. Yeah, no, I don't remember the, the reason why it is, but it is. It's a problem now. It is a problem. Why did it Yeah. Wow. It was too bad. It was too bad. But uh, yes, anyway, but it was uh, covering the same region with uh, not such a high uh, projection, but uh, okay. it was, uh, it was uh, here. And all these continuous lines, they're still taking data? Yes, yes, I believe so. I don't know, actually, I don't know if they will improve by a lot. It's more or less uh, like Fermi problem. Okay. But uh, they will not say anything conclusive about the line because, I, as I will see, uh, we need other information. And we need something like this with this resolution. Exactly. Okay. So, can you look at the y axis? Oh, this is the, I think it's uh, the flux in terms of uh, um, number of photons. Uh, over surface over time. Uh, it may be the energy, the flux of energy, not the numerical flux. But, uh, but that, that, that's just uh, how much we get from this experiment uh, as a function of the surface and the, and the, and the time of exposition. It will tell us more or less what sensitivity rates we get in the future. OK. So finally, why access? So I already anticipated this. And the reason why I'm focusing on X-ray rays, and the reason not only myself, but people are looking at this region of the sky with uh, some uh, uh, excitement, is because there is a motivated dark matter candidate, the steroid neutrino I mentioned before, which can be produced successfully in the early universe in this mass range uh, through some uh, production, through oscillation, actually. Uh, there are other limits, so it's likely that we need some uh, resonant production uh, with some enhanced electron asymmetry. But as I hinted already, there is a smoking gas signature of this type of dark candidates where you are basically observing the decay of the sterile uh, neutrino to active neutrino and photon. The energy of the photon is half of the sterile neutrino mass. You can neglect safely the active neutrino mass in this uh, kinematical calculation. And the lifetime, you know, there are interesting regions where you get the correct value density. You get a lifetime long enough such that the dark matter is stable on cosmological scales, scales, and you get a flux that our instruments can measure. Okay? So can you say this the which um, and the neutrino? So I think at this level it doesn't matter when you are in the early universe uh, uh, to produce this uh, no, that is really constraint, no? constraints know, uh, from you have a lot of constraints of the neutrino with the electron neutrino the but these are quite uh, heavy so you're talking about like terrestrial constraints like clubs current no. I don't think uh, this is relevant because you see this mixing is really, really small. No, that mixing is small. small. Yeah, no, I think it's it, well, it's a function of the mass. So, what, what, from, from what experiment? Well, yes, it is. It is what kind of question I'm saying? I've seen not recently <laughs> uh, three plots now. I can even talk about it later. But it's like uh, the you know, mass of the stellar neutrino versus the mixing angle for mixing angle with the uh, electron, neon, or you remember the mass range of the plot? You remember the mass range? Because here it's all, because we shot all the experiments, but it was well off. But I think yes, the, the one I remember is uh, for instance, from the supernova encoding, right? There's a huge. Uh, uh, because the, the, the standard neutrinos can contribute to the cooling of the supernova, right? 
and then you have a lot of constraints coming from that. Yeah, 3 kV, yes, because usually in the neutrino energy is MeV for supernova. Yeah, that, that's true. So actually, supernova, you're right, that's MeV. So you, if you have KV part from that particular case, but there was other... Okay, so what I, what I can tell you is that um, if you, well, if you plug the numbers for the 3.5, which is my next slide, uh -huh. that's not excluded. That mass and mixing angle is not excluded. Okay. It's excluded this but type this of production. Is this is the question of which, which you consider. No, I mean, it's not excluded for any of the neutrinos. I believe so, I believe so, I believe so. I believe for any of the neutrinos. Uh, there is one bound on warm dark matter, uh, which comes from um, lemon alpha um, lines and that's more than 3 kV, I guess we learned. Right, but that's for... Uh, these Lyman alpha bounds, they depend on the spectrum, on the injection spectrum. So... Uh, this, is, this is safe. This is safe because it's... Um, well, I mean, of course, uh, it depends on how cold they were when structure formed. So, right. Uh, if you do the calculation of production of neutrinos through uh, this uh, this way, then you, you should talk to your friend uh, Matteo here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he's the world expert. Yes. He's, the, he's the world expert. But uh, at three point five, well, actually, I'm sorry. If you talk about three point five kV line, the number to keep in mind is seven kV, of course. It's not three point five because seven, you, seven, seven, seven is fine for sure. Yes, yeah, seven is fine. But. Um, yeah, yeah, so if I remember, actually, you're right, the number for, you know, to do this uh, type of uh, Lyman alpha bound, you need to know the spectrum they were produced with. Okay, so for example, an axon is much uh, lower in mass than KV, but it's safe because it's very cold. Yes. So for the sterile neutrinos, as Matteo will, will teach us, I think it's uh, 4 KV, the number I have in mind. So we are near the edge, but it's safe. So it depends on the, you're talking how many, how many do you need for the 3.5 kV line or in general? Well, in general, if you fix the mass, for example, let's say the mass is 7 kV, there is no freedom to fix the number density because we measure the mass density. So the mass density is number density times the mass. So by the time I tell you the mass, I'm also telling you the number density of these neutrinos. Then you can compute the, associ the associated flux. Well, actually, the flux comes from uh, galaxies, so the density is different. There. But even there, we know rho. So if I tell you m, then I need the uh, n. So you need uh, some uh, big flux, let's say. Yes, 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 yes. You need flux. You need the flux, yes, yes. But uh, for example, for imagine you have a signal, you see a line at some region. Uh -huh. So you, you reconstruct the mass. And then uh, to see the amount of lifetime you need, you use as an information the number density that you know. Because if I look, for example, at the dwarf galaxy, I know the row. And by knowing the row, once I tell you the mass, I also know n. So I compute the flux as a function of the lifetime, and then I get the lifetime in. Using this equation, then I learn about the missing end. So that's the. Okay. Do you also have an annihilation of these guys too? No, because you, you, you know, every. Square. Square. Exactly. Not. The cup, this coupling is small, so... Ah, the branch duration for this is small. Not only the branch duration, but, the you know, it's like any weakly coupled particles. Uh, each time you have one of these particles in the Feynman diagram, you pay a huge price. So for the annihilation, you pay the, you pay the square. So it's uh, more convenient to have processes where you have only one of these. Plus, uh, for the annihilation, you pay also flux, because you need two of them. Here, you just have to wait, the they decay. So the annihilation rate is really small. Have you mostly the very density In what uh, in what equation? In, uh, no, when you consider the, 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 the first equation. There. So you see, there is one relation giving us the relic density, and one relation giving us the rate. Okay. 
So in this plane, theta m, you have relic density lines, you have uh, uh, lines for the lifetime, and uh, you can uh, identify. So we can uh, discuss one example, which is the 3.5 carry line. Oh, which one? This is going to come for the like So a line was discovered. Now the interpretation of the line is uh, the line is there, no question. So, so, so. The line is there. The line is there. So this line was um, discovered in uh, 2014 in a cluster, by observing cluster of galaxies, by observing the center of the Milky Way. And the M31, I think it was not conclusive, the discovery. Some group found the line, some group didn't find the line. So let's not discuss about M31. Let's just say that by looking at these environments, there was a line in and the reason why there was, and I now I come back to your question. So now we have a signal, okay? We have a signal. The signal is a line at 3.5 TV. I immediately learned that if I want to explain this with neutrino, I need the mass of the right hand the neutrino to be 7 kV. How much the mixing angle? I compute the flux as a function of, I fix the end, so there is all one three parameter, I fix the mixing angle. And so there was a lot of excitement back in 2014 because you know, this is a Dark matter candidate motivated from particle physics. We expect that there has to be some uh, right handed neutrinos, and these numbers are not excluded. This mixing angle is really small. Okay, so this is viable. Uh, the only thing is that if you try to plug these numbers in the relic density here, you don't get what you need, but you can fix that by imposing some extra electron asymmetry, so you have some resonant production. So, it could be the neutrino. At the level of this light, it could be a neutrino. But then, the, as we will see, there are, there are problems. And you also have other, other, other contributions. Other arithmetic updates that you don't need to deal with. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So, because you are telling to the small density. Yes. You need some enhancement by, the, by the, this lepton uh, asymmetry. Production. You, you were saying that this line could also be due by other dark matter candidates, not just the neutrinos, of course, of course. And this wasn't seen in these dark matter rich satellites. I get to that. Okay. I get that. I get to that. I get to that. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. That's one of the problems. Not the only problem, but also. Uh, so yes, as it was pointed out, uh, imagine you have uh, dark matter with uh, mass 3.5 kV, which has an annihilation channel to two photons. That's also a way to get the line. So, or a dark matter candidate of 7 kV decay to two photons, not the neutrino. So there are other ways, of course, to get this uh, design. Neutrino is the one which fits nicely within the framework of neutrino masses. But as I say, and as I will do later, we don't have to solve every time two problems. We can just have dark matter given this time. But let's look at this line. So are you saying that this? Uh, No, no, I'm just saying that uh, we expect that uh, there must be right handed neutrinos in the universe. No? Not necessarily. How do you give the mass to. No, we expect them then. No, not at this scale. Not at this scale. If you think my expect them, then I expect them at the very heavy scale. But, uh, well, but that's, that's what you expect. Right? I mean, I, 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 that's, uh, that's uh, an opinion, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it's an opinion. But I'm just saying that. By the time you want to explain that better, you have to introduce one, at least one new degree of freedom. Okay? And uh, here you are introducing a degree of freedom that could be there for other reasons. That's what I'm saying. I think you can accept that, right? Okay. I mean, if you don't like the 7 kV ranges. Uh, for CSO, it doesn't work. Of course, of course. No, no, I know, I know, I know. I know. Right. 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 But uh, I'm, I'm just saying that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not the argument. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm just saying that we need new degrees of freedom for dark matter. If you add this. It's fine. It's fine. I'm an expectation. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Of course, I know that the CISO scale is completely different. I agree. 
but uh, okay so let's look at the line with some uh, uh, more uh, critical spirit okay so if I see a line in the gamma ray region hundreds of GV that's good because unless my instrument is doing something wrong there is no known astronomical astrophysical process giving me run lines at such a high energy okay it's uh, hundreds of GV once we move in these X-ray regions there are there is a let, let me call it standard model physics there is standard model physics that could give me lines these are just lines from atoms which have a large number of protons large Z so not the hydrogen but uh, if I put Z this is the Bohr energy, the binding energy Z of the order of 20 then I get in the KV region and uh, there is an excited state of potassium 18 potassium 18 is potassium ionized 18 times so it's a very fancy way of calling the high, uh, helium like potassium okay? because potassium is 20 you ionize it 18 times 20 minus 18 is Q helium like okay? so, it's a good way to call this high K so this type of, uh, of uh, atom helium like uh, atom um, as an excited state as a transition line precisely at this, uh, at this uh, and the transition line shifts if I add the other guys around it. Uh, what are the other guys? What are the, other, the other electrons? Uh, yes, it's yes. not just, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. No, no, yeah. You, 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 you really need to have this funny the 18, the 18. guy. But you know, in the, in the cluster, there are uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. potassium yeah. atoms with several level of ionization. You also have this one. I see. So, what are we observing? Some new physics or just potassium? Now, one way to do this could be to try to estimate as much as, much as possible with the best accuracy the so-called brightness of the potassium, which means try to estimate how many photons we expect to come from this. This is a background, okay? We, we could uh, estimate this background in a very careful way and then do a subtraction and see if we see more than we expect. Now, this is very tricky and uh, I don't think it can work because we don't know the density very well of this potassium. Moreover, we don't know the temperature of the potassium in the plasma and the brightness has a very steep dependence on the temperature. So even our ignorance about the temperature by a few can translate in a huge uncertainty. So people try, but I think it's uh, not very promising. But shouldn't that be easy to do by looking at other lines of potassium? If you're just looking, yeah, the temperature and then uh, the temperature. What about all the other, the other, the yeah, it's not more yeah. Yeah. there's a, so you don't the know how much. Normal right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but we don't know that within the accuracy that we need in order to be subtraction. Yeah, I mean, you can look at that, but there, there is an error in the subtraction. Okay. Yeah. The accuracy, no, but I know that people try, people try, but, uh, yeah. and also you need to know the temperature very well, and you measure this temperature from like synchrotron radiation, uh, emission spectra but again the brightness uh, is a very steep dependence on the temperature so okay. having a very I mean you, you can do this but it's still not crazy that it could be potassium is the Say it again? it's not crazy that it could be it's, it's not crazy at all and it probably is it probably is so it's not crazy at all but I think the reason why I believe it is probably potassium is not because of this subtraction but it's because of the things I have in the next slide Okay. So, so that's why you wouldn't see it uh, <laughs> You are anticipating the surprise, thank you. So I, I think there is another one by another element. Uh, I don't remember, but I mean this is the main one. This is the main one. At this uh, at this energy. These are known very precise in this line. So this is the, the dominant contribution at 3.5 kg. Okay, so it's hopeless to discriminate between the origin, these two origin, just by looking at this light. So let's uh, try to do something else.
So if it is from dark matter, which is what we really hope, okay, we should see the line also in other environments. For example, in an environment which is totally dominated by the dark matter and potassium-free environment, okay? If this is just dark matter decaying, I look at the place where there is most dark matter and no potassium, I should see loss of 3.5 kV on heat in my head. Moreover, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the morphology. So if I look at a photon coming from there, it was produced there. Now, within these clusters, the distribution of dark matter and distribution of the potassium it's very different, the spatial distribution, the radial profile. So these 3.5 kV photons should follow a morphology which is tracking the dark matter distribution, if it is from dark matter. How will we know the, the core cuspy profile of the... But core cuspy, that's for the galaxy. This is a cluster. Uh, it's a cluster, so it's not a galaxy. Yeah, okay. What you say is relevant for the... Oh, you said the first one is a galaxy, the second one is a cluster. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the first one is uh, several things, as I mentioned. The next slide. Uh, this one, let's think about a cluster. Let's think about a cluster. Okay, so let's think about a cluster. So for the cluster, there is not this issue of the, the, the galaxy. It's a spherical symmetry. Okay, so let's uh, go to the bad news now. Okay. So look for the line somewhere else. So here is a list of references. People try to look for the line in the dwarf galaxies. Stacking. Dwarf. Also stacking all the dwarf galaxies. No, even it's stacking. Stacking means you have just different galaxies with different spectra, right? And you just put one on top of the other and you see you have more data, more signal. That's what people have done with clusters as well to find this 2.5 baby. Yeah, that's that's for the you just add the spectrum, right? Yeah, just add. I think in this case it's, uh, it's uh, just one individual, by one. one by one. But, uh, but uh, I'm not actually 100% sure. Isn't stacking just the same as having statistical analysis of a whole bunch of them? So I'm just sampling here. Stacking is just one way to... Adding more data. Adding data. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think they stacking here. But again, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so no line in the work galaxy. Now, you look at galaxies where there is a plasma, but the plasma temperature is much, much smaller than the one of the Milky Way, for example. As I mentioned, the potassium brightness has a very steep dependence on the temperature. So if you look at some uh, cold environment, you don't expect any line from uh, the, the potassium, but you still expect light from the aquarium. And of course, no line there. Now, Something nice I would like to mention, which is uh, a paper that came out almost one year ago. This is uh, very recent news on the 3.5 kV line. It's that these people realize that if you look at the Milky Way, but not toward the center, but you look off of the galactic plane, the integrated luminosity computed according to the dark matter distribution is enough that we should see a line there, okay? They look for the line there. Again, imagine this is the galactic plane, they look high, no line there. And of course, if it is from potassium, that's what you expect because there is no plasma of the galactic plane, okay? So all of these things are telling you that it's probably potassium. Now, <coughs> In 2015, there was also the study of the morphology of the 3.5 kV photon in uh, the cluster, Perseus, for example. You look at the directions of these photons and you look at the, at the location where they were produced, and they realized that the morphology is correlated with the one of the plasma. Okay, you see the photons where there are also I think. potassium, yeah, where there, where there is the plasma. When if you look at the region where there is uh, not much plasma, but there is a lot of dark matter, you don't see 3.5 kV photons coming from there. Which is again what you expect if you want that this to be the, the origin of the line. So, to conclude, known, and I emphasize on known 
that my interpretation, such as the strong neutrinos, are inconsistent with this complementary observation. None. Okay? Because now? No. <laughs> None <laughs> until now. <laughs> At the end of this talk, <laughs> I can remove this underlying. <laughs> okay. So by none, I mean the strong neutrinos, but also annihilation or decays and every other framework uh, that has been suggested to, to explain the line. Okay, so this is now what we are suggesting. And uh, I would like to emphasize that this is a way, it was a fun exercise to, to say, okay, there is a line at 3.5 kV, and this is what the situation looks like. Can it still be dark matter? Okay? Can it still be dark matter? That was the exercise. And in playing this uh, game, in doing this exercise, we realized that the solution we found is actually something that goes beyond uh, accounting for the 3.5 kV line, but it's uh, a new mechanism to produce X-ray lines in environments such as the galactic center and the, the clusters that has a very unique features that can be tested in the future by these new satellites in the X-ray. Okay, so the situation can be summarized by this uh, slide. Basically, you need a state, a two-state system. You need a Chi-1 and a Chi-2. And the mass splitting between these two states has to be much smaller than the overall mass scale. Okay? So that's the first ingredient. And uh, you have uh, only the lightest one, which is stable. Chi-1. Chi-2 is unstable. You also want the interactions of your theory to give you a suppressed, here I put this symbol, all I mean is that it's suppressed. Maybe you get that at the next to the leading order, but it's not something that you find at three level. You suppress the elastic scattering of chi-1 with f, where f is any fermion in the plasma. Let's say an electron for concreteness, okay? So this rate is suppressed. This inelastic upscattering process is allowed at three level, okay? So you have processes where chi-1 is an electron, and you get the K2 and an electron. Now, the way you produce lines is just summarized here. You have Chi1 around in the cluster, for example. You hit the fermion, you produce K2, and then K2 eventually decays to K1 and the photon. And the energy of the photon is pretty much the mass split. Okay? This is just kinematics. Okay? So now, I will give you a Lagrangian in the next slide, I will give you a, an explicit realization of this framework, but let me just emphasize that this is a way to produce line which is not inconsistent with all the observations. Because imagine that you have the 3.5 kV line, KV line produced by this kind of uh, mechanism, then it's not a surprise that you don't see a line in the regions where there is no plasma, because you need the plasma to excite first. If there is no plasma, K1 will just stay there and will give you nothing. Also because the annihilations are very suppressed because of this. So you need really the plasma to excite the, the, the lowest state. And moreover, it's not a surprise that the morphology of the photons is also, I mean, at this level of precision, we cannot distinguish between plasma and this one, but the fact that the morphology of the photons tracks the plasma is because the photons can only be reproduced in regions where the plasma is present. Okay? Because if you don't have a fermion, then there is no way to excite chi1 to k2 and then to decay. Okay? So this is just a cartoon to illustrate the way it works. Now we will go to the realization. Do you expect more broadening in this case? Because it's you know, these chi2s and it's scattered first. Uh, well, I guess it depends on m. What do you mean by broadening? Well, you know, these, these chi 2s are getting boosted. Uh, the you mean the Doppler? Yeah, yeah. I'll get to that. Yeah. F plus, F plus, F plus. Yeah, that's one of actually a unique feature which is different from. And if you have these, these really good experiments. Exactly, exactly. That's one way to distinguish. I think the chi 2 is almost at rest. Right? Um, so the same M is big enough. Yeah, so it depends, yeah, on, yeah. The, it depends on the mass, it also depends yeah. on the temperature of the plasma. I think it depends on the mass. 
Because I have to, F has to give enough energy to decide I want to put it. But if M is low, then I'll get a Yeah, it depends on the mass because otherwise it don't transfer enough movement. No, it also depends on the mass. Also. The mass yeah, and the mass. It depends on the different Because I get kicked, yeah, yeah. And so there'll be some boost. I will, show, I will show you plot, but this is actually a very good point because it's a way. So the, the, the broadening of this line, since you have such a good resolution, now the broadening is due to Doppler, and uh, the way you get the line broadened by this mechanism is uh, different than the one you get from neutrinos and the one you get from potassium. So it's one of the way, one of the different ways you can use distinguish this from the others. Okay, so. I, the idea is clear, right? This is a just a simple description of uh, the way it works. Now we go to an actual realization. Okay, so this is the explicit realization we studied in this paper in 2016. We wanted to see if we could write down a theory where uh, you have uh, a, you can explain the three point five k line. Okay, I didn't say that this feature here. And this feature here, I don't want to impose them by hand. Okay? See, here you have a mass splitting much smaller than n chi. Here is a mass, uh, this uh, process which is forbidden at three level. Even though this uh, framework is not addressing any major problem in particle physics, I still want to have good taste. Okay? So uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to say delta m is much smaller than m just because I say so. I want it to be natural in the sense that we all understand. Okay? Okay, so <coughs> let's uh, start. Field content. Q by fermions, both standard model sequence. Interactions. Dimension 5 dipole operator with the photon. Okay? So once you write down this theory, you see that the small mass splitting is natural because you can write these are standard model singlets. You have a Dirac mass and a Majorana mass. All you need is that the Majorana mass is much smaller than the Dirac mass. This is a natural limit. It's technically natural, okay? To have the Majorana mass much smaller than the Dirac mass. Also, the interaction being off diagonal is uh, natural in the sense that you cannot write a dipole for a Majorana fermion. Sorry, diagonal dipole. So you only have this interaction. now. Psi 1 and Psi 2 are the mass eigenstates. Okay? So you don't have Psi 1, Psi 1, because these are Majorana fermions, so that's just zero. Okay? So these two features in these uh, realizations are natural. It's not something I impose by hand and it's not protected by any symmetry. Okay? Okay, so this is the way it works. You have this dipole interaction of diagonal, you exchange a photon in the T channel you hit one electron, you excite to chi q, and then eventually chi q decays with the same interaction. So the same interaction gives you the upscattering and then the decay, the dipole. So in this plot uh, here, you have the overall mass on the horizontal axis. The mass splitting here is set to 3.5 kV, of course, because we want to reproduce the line. And here is the flux of photons. The green line, the green band, is the observed amount of photons for the 3.5 kV line in the galactic center and in the cluster Perseus. Okay, so my theory has to produce an amount of flux which fits within this band. Okay? Now the, 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 the blue line solid is electric and the dash is magnetic. It's giving you um, the rate you expect from the theory by setting this lambda, uh, this cutoff, uh, in a way which is consistent with the other bounds that we will see in the next slide. So you see that if you scatter off electrons and you have this interaction mediated mostly by the electric dipole, so the C, the CP vibrating electric dipole, you see that in the low mass region you have a flux which is big enough to explain the 3.5 k line both in the galactic center and in the cluster. Okay? So this works. Okay? Uh, so far I've been just discussing about the flux. Now let's look at the parameter space. So, so yes. <coughs> on these plots, I mean, you could in principle put you know, 
sort of the, the range of the potassium-18 uh, line that would serve in part as a, as a background uh, for, for this. I mean, unless you can sort of you know, resolve the two. Uh, I, here, I'm assuming that all the photons are coming from the dark matters, yes. So I'm assuming yeah, that the yeah, potassium yeah. is a much but more... How many orders of magnitude do the estimates uh, for the contributions from uh, the potassium-18? So I think the, it's fair to say that the uncertainty is large enough that you can take it to be a subdominant contribution. It can be. It can I mean, be. I'm just curious what it looks like on... I mean, the uncertainty is really large in our knowledge of the, of the, of the flux coming from potassium. So here for this plot, I'm assuming that all the photons yeah, are coming yeah, from this, sure, uh, sure. this mechanism here. And uh, yeah, so these are two Majorana fermions with a very small mass splitting. So you can imagine this as the overall mass, and the splitting is 3.5 kV, so they are almost degenerate. So it's, it's enough to have one axis for the mass. Okay, so the line works. I mean, we can explain the line. And uh, here, I have the coefficient of the electric dipole moment, the inverse coefficient, so lambda over C, here I have lambda over Cm, and in this plane, I show you the bands where you have the flux that you need for the 3.5 kV line. So what units are this? Um, GV, sorry, I'm sorry. It's lambda over C, so it's the cutoff of the operator over the coefficient, so it's a GV. And uh, if you want to complain uh, about the, the region we identify, I will be with you about, the, about uh, this number here. No, I was uh, complaining about something else. I complain about something else. <laughs> okay, okay, please, please, please complain. Please complain. <laughs> then, then I will complain. No, I am complaining. That's not true. I want to ask a question. So, uh, so this is obviously uh, cut off, as you already said, no? Exactly. So now also it's kind of constrained, no? Because uh, um, how you can generate this kind of type of operators in a new charge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. That, uh, that we are complaining about the same things, yes, yes, yes. Okay, maybe I am. Maybe I am. I yeah, yeah, no, no, but, uh, but uh, I, I, will, I will discuss. <laughs> okay, okay, so yes, I, I wonder if, if, if it's obvious enough to, to, to consider EFT uh, here, or if you want to go really to the moment that depends on such. So, okay, let's look at this plot more carefully and then we'll get to your question. But I, this is a point I was, and you're absolutely right, I'm, I was about to make that. So as I say, the 3.5 kV line flux is mostly set, let's say entirely set, by the coefficient of the electric dipole moment, C. So that's why these bands are horizontal. Okay? So we want, to leave, we want to leave in this region. Okay? Now, uh, there are constraints from particle physics, like uh, the running of the electromagnetic coupling, because this vertex you just close the loop and you have a contribution to the alpha. This is the gray region, which is excluded. Assuming that the states are above the cutoff, of course, which is something I will get to in a second. Now, this uh, orange band is uh, what you need to achieve the correct value density, which is also a calculation you have to do, because you know the theory very well. You can just rotate this diagram by 90 degrees, and that's what gives you the result. Okay? And we did that. And uh, we found that the right density is mostly set by a magnetic dipole moment because it's S wave as opposed to the latter, which is P wave. Okay? So this is the region where we want to live for the mass of 15 MeV, which was the best uh, we, we could find. So we want to live here. Now, as you were pointing out, this point here corresponds to lambda over C of 200 GV. Let's keep this number in mind because when we discuss UV completions later, this doesn't look so good because this operator is likely to be generated. If you think about the simplest UV completion, you have charged states that you iterate out in a loop and you get photons radiated from the virtual states. And this uh, C over lambda is related to the mass of the charged states you iterate out times the loop factor times the actual charge. So we will discuss that, but I can anticipate that I'm not really happy about this now, in terms of UV completions, okay? Because you need very light charge states, which are likely excluded, so you need the high multiplicity. We will discuss that later, okay? But I agree that from this plot, you can start to wonder about the UV completion. 
and uh, this type of theory is not the one that makes me very happy and we are working on something better now. Okay? This is GV, yeah, so this is 200 GV. Here it looks better, it's 4 TV, which is still actually not so nice. But, but actually, okay, it depends on how strong it is. You just say it's also coupled to side one, side two, but the mass could be much, low, much smaller than that. But if it's not a strongly coupled theory, but the reason that you need to couple theory is that this coupling between side one, side two, and the new charge state is reasonably weak, then the effective field theory stops much lower now. Exactly, much lower than 200 GV. Yeah, That's yeah, why so I don't like much that. Lower than yes, that. yes, I agree, I agree. And I, I will show you an equation for this width of the visual later. Well, later. But uh, yes, no, no, I mean, yes. this, is, uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, this is not the most appealing case for the 3.5 KV line. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, let's forget about the 3.5 KV line. Why? Because it's probably potassium. <laughs> I say it's prob probably. Probably means that it's not 100%. It should, it should be the title of your talk. It's probably it's probably. I, know I, I know I'm being recorded, so I'm being very careful about what I say. Probably. It, means, it may be or maybe not. It's not the pain of the device of the so, with these new experiments, what will happen is that we will have such a good resolution, now coming back to your comment, if it's coming from potassium, you expect some Doppler width of the line, because you know the temperature of the potassium, you know the mass of the potassium, you can compute the width. If it's coming from neutrinos, like uh, 7 kV sterile neutrinos, again, you know that they move with a given speed, sorry, the, the, the velocity dispersion in the cluster, and so you can estimate the width. And they're very different. I mean, they are, uh, the difference is uh, something you can distinguish with new, new experiments. So in the future, we will know conclusively if this is potassium or if it's something else. Okay? So while we wait for this, let's make uh, this uh, framework more general. Okay? So why do I want to focus on 3.5 kV? This is a way that produce, to produce X-ray lines everywhere, for every mass splitting. And uh, this is something that these future experiments will be able to test in the next years. By the significant improvement in the flux that will be tested in the future, as I showed in the previous slide. Now, here, this is the work that we do with uh, my student, Alessandro Granelli. Uh, as I will show you this mechanism has a very peculiar properties that we can look for in the future and we can use to discriminate an X-ray line from this origin with respect to the others. Okay, so in this equation I just sketched the kind of fluxes we expect in the future. This is a number of photons, differential in energy and solid angle. So forgetting about the pi factors and uh, so what does it depend on? So this is an integral over the line of sight of the number density of chi and the number density of f, the initial states. So you have both dark matter and plasma. This is different. Like when you have neutrinos, you only have n chi. When you have potassium, you only have n phi, n f, sorry. Here you have both. You have the product because you need both. Then you have the thermal average of the cross section for this process. You have to average over all the possible incoming velocity, you know distribution, you do an average in the proper way. And then you have this function that I call f. So f of e gamma, this is the spread due to the, the width, the broadening you get of the line due to the Doppler effect. Okay? I'm assuming that the instrumental resolution is small enough that they can forget about that. There is still a broadening because these objects emitting photons are moving. Okay? So it's not a delta function. Even if I have a perfect instrument, it's not a delta function. Okay, so let's look at these uh, peculiar properties. We expect to see lines only from hot regions. Okay, if you look at different uh, clusters with different plasma temperatures, here I have some example. Here I fix the mass, I consider three different mass splittings, and uh, as a function of the temperature, I plot the cross section in some units. It doesn't matter the unit. The cross section as a function of the temperature, you see that goes to zero as the temperature goes below the mass split, which is what I expect, because if the temperature is below the mass splitting, I don't have enough kinetic energy to excite K 
chi1 to chi2. And of course, if I take a large mass splitting, like the green line, the cross section goes to zero more quickly because I hit the kinematical threshold before. Okay? So this is, by the way, exactly what we see in the 3.5 kV line because if we look at cold environment, we don't see anything. Yeah, so, so to to this, uh, this is not something we need to do. This is just, uh, we are producing plots for several masses. Yeah. So this is not uh, a number that has I mean, any meaning. Yeah, so I can anticipate that one effect, which is the leading effect, which is why it's not a good thing to go to much, much higher masses, mm -hmm. is that you pay a, a price here. N chi is rho chi over M. We know rho of dark matter. We know how much energy density is there. So if you go to large masses, you are depleting the flux. Okay. And the plot before, sorry, I asked this now. Uh, this one? Exactly. Yeah, what happens here? I mean, can you, what can you do with this? Oh, no, here look, you can see what happens here. Uh, you don't. You don't uh, Manage to account for the 3.5 kV line anymore. So, so the of masses, yes, yes, for the masses, yes. Okay. Now the morphology. If I plot here, it's a plot we did for Perseus. This is the J factor, which is just uh, the distribution as a function of the of the radius of the of the cluster. The distribution of the photon coming from the line as a function of the distance from the center of the cluster. Okay. You see that this is something we can predict. And it looks very, very different from the case where it's a potassium or from the case where it's a neutrino, neutrino-like, something decay. Okay. So also by looking at the morphology of some line we may discover in the future, this is something that will allow us to distinguish this from other methods. Now, the most interesting one, especially thanks to the extremely high resolution of future experiments, is the peculiar spectral shape. Oops, sorry. So here I fix the mass and I consider different mass splittings. Here I fix the mass splitting, I consider different masses, so you can do these plots for every case. And you see that the width of the line from the potassium, the one from the neutrinos, and the one from these mechanisms. It's something that, you know, here is the, this x variable is the energy of the line over the, the energy in, the, in the, the reference energy, the one in the center of mass ray, okay, where the decay happens. So remember that here we're talking about percent and the resolution is per million, okay? So this is something that eventually we will be able to measure. So the potassium has a very small doctor. Uh, Potassium is a very small uh, Doppler because it's kind of moving slow. Okay, and the neutrino, we know that the velocity dispersion is uh, some number, units of the speed of light, no relativistic, but the mass is 7 kV, so it's uh, much lighter than the potassium. Density. So the potassium line is very, very narrow. Which, by the way, if you forget about my framework, this is what in the, the, the future way to distinguish between the two different origin of the 3.5 kV line. So besides what I'm telling you today, this is general. The scale, the scale, the is the same in both. These are probabilities normalized to one. Yes. No, no, horizontal. horizontal. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. So this is. Uh, this is. Yeah. You cannot read here. It's. Uh, it's a dimensionless variable. It's the energy of the photons you get divided by 3.5 in this case. So here is uh, zero, zero, 0, 2, 0, 0, 4, yes. I think so, yes. Actually, yeah, the, the projector is not good enough. But yes. I can, see, I can see general for <laughs> You can see that. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, they are the same. They are the same. They are the same. <laughs> Sorry, the zoom in bump is the potassium bump on top. No, of the no, bump. this is just the, the, you know, 15 MeV, 3.5 kV, it's the, 
the case that explains the 3.5 kV line. Don't, don't worry about this, uh, this zoom in. This, this is just the best case to explain the 3.5 kV line. Yeah. We wanted to highlight that. But this is the preliminary plot. We, we, we may remove this. Okay. So forget about the zoom. This is just the case I showed you in the previous slide for the 3.5 kV line. So the messages with your new. Uh, what, what? The messages with your new mechanism. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, you, you. I mean, if I just try to put this potassium now in my it's, head uh, inside, it's extremely. It's broader, it's broader. It's broader. It's broader because, you know, it's very different here from uh, in the scale. So the horizontal scale here is the same, but it's not here. So it's much broader. So, ah. Yeah, this is 10 over. This is ah, yeah, there is, uh, there is a That's 10 over 2, 10 over 4 around the farther region. This is like way, it's, not, it's on top of the scale of that. Exactly, exactly, yes. I confirm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was the first number on the right of the middle? Of the Here? Yeah. 1.002. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's much smaller, but... Of exactly, so this is much broader. This is much broader. This yeah, the, 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 in this magnitude, the lines are much broader. Yes, yeah, so it's yeah. smaller. Okay. But this is something that you cannot appreciate with current instruments, because at the resolution level we have now, the, they all look the same, but in the future you can uh, discriminate. But this, uh, I mean, the y-axis are also extremely different. Right? Yeah, so the way, the way we normalize the probability here is, uh, so here you may wonder why the integral is not the same. And there is a reason. The reason is that we started to normalize the distribution for the initial states. And as you change the mass and the mass splitting, the number of KQ you manage to excite changes, okay? So that's the way we normalize things. So we normalize the initial state and then of course in the final state we, because, because this is a plot obtained by KQ decays, but the number of KQ man, you manage to excite is different as you change the mass. What is the timeline for the resolution? The one? Timeline, when can I resolve this? Oh, that's in, it was in my previous slide, like in 10 years time. Ten time years. Time, yes, 10 years, yes. Athena. So what's the DP by DX of just other crappy backgrounds? Uh, there's some, I don't know if I remember looking at uh, you know, KEV lines for atomic transitions in grad school experiments. There's some crappy floor uh, above which you look for the, for the lines. Uh, yeah, I mean, is there an astrophysical? You mean uh, the one from potassium? No, 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 just from other stuff making uh, KEV uh, photons. Out but in the, in the astrophysical environment, you mean? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that's, this is what, I mean, in this case... Yeah, these, these, are, these are lines. I, I thought there's like some sort of continuous continue? background. Yeah, continuum background. What's the DP by the X of the continuum background? That, that's something I, I don't remember. But usually, the continuum is uh, I don't believe it's dominated by potassium. The continuum is dominated no, by potassium. No, 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 no. yeah. So, so this is continuous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's something. Where is the continuum? No, no. I have no clue. Of course, it's much, much more than this. But you have to do a. You have to look for a spectral feature, so you have to do some subtraction, and uh, this is all things that have to be done carefully eventually, as they did for the line. It was like looking for for die chats on the background of the TCU. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Sorry, the question. The trade is the right Yeah, so actually. This also depends on the on the mass of the So. Yes, yes. So I am. Uh, this plot was done for a random number of 17 in the Because I also want to deliver the message. So I just fit you also to have it. Of course, of course, it will change. Because the velocity is what is fixed. In the, in the, the velocity of dispersion of dark matter is what is fixed. But if you change the mass, of course, the doctor. I wanted to fix this to 7 kV because I wanted to show you the difference also for the 3.5 kV line, which is something that we have to understand eventually. Okay. So this is, but uh, you can, you know, we are producing plots and we can make these plots basically for any mass of the particle decaying to Q photons or Q photons and one neutrinos. And that's something we can. Okay, so this is for 7 kV. Very good. Now, before we go, bad uh, news, more bad news, Gero. <laughs> so you're right. Uh, this is one of the reasons why 
I no, I'm not entirely satis satisfied with this model because you know if you do a naive estimate of uh, these coefficients C M C so you have an electric charge assuming these uh, new states are charge one in units of the electric of the electron charge you have this G dark over 16 pi square where G dark is uh, the strength of this coupling so imagine this is a weak so you pay some suppression moreover you have some parallel suppression of the mass of the dark matter which is in the MeV range over the mass of the new state square this is the new charge particle that you get so if you want this to be 1 over 200 GeV then you get some crazy number for this charge state which is absolutely excluded it depends on the charge no, 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 it doesn't, because you have also this suppression here. This is, think about this F10 MeV. So you have 1 over 200 GeV. Ah, okay. Even if you take this free factor equal to 1, mm -hmm. it's still bad. Okay, so the message I get from this is that is it difficult to explain the 3.5 KV line with this, only with this type of operator? once you start to think about UV completion. Maybe you can think that you have 500 of these states, but of course then you have other problems. So I, I think it's difficult. But uh, on the other hand, it's also true that what we are studying now, this is work uh, heavily in progress, so I don't have a final answer, but it could be possible that even if you plug numbers of realistic UV completions, forget about the 3.5 KV line. This is something you can test in the future. The signal can be strong enough to be seen by future experiments. Okay? So before I conclude, uh, some uh, very recent idea that we've been discussing over the last uh, months with uh, Alessandro. And uh, here we add another ingredient. On top of this uh, dipole operator, which is something we need for K2 to eventually decay, we also add some dark photon. So this JMU dark contains the standard model singlets, the K1 and K2. Then you have this dark photon, which inevitably mixes with our photon. And then uh, you have, for example, so you can think about the situation where the uh, excitation is mediated by the dark photon, and the decay is mediated by the dipole operator. Then this 200 GV number I mentioned to you before is completely different because the, I didn't say that, but in order to get a high enough rate, the 200 GV, these are requests that come entirely from the upscattering rate. The decay is very fast. The decay is super fast. So once you measure the, once you estimate the flux, uh, it's uh, all about upscattering. And uh, if uh, you cannot achieve a big enough upscattering through this, you can think about adding another ingredient. And then the dipole can still be strong enough to mediate the subsequent decay of IT. Okay. So this is something we are exploring at the moment, and uh, I think it's nice also because there is a connection with the phenomenology, and then you can look for complementary probes of this. Let me get to the conclusion. Okay, so this is the summary of uh, our idea. This is a new way to generate lines, where all you have left today in the galaxy is chi-1, the blue line, but if chi-1 can manage to talk to an electron, for example, inelastically, then K2 will decay to K1 and the photon. These are uh, peculiar properties which are exactly the one you need for the 3.5 kV line. So the 3.5 kV line could still be from dark matter if this is the mechanism producing that. Namely, you have lines only from one region, you have a very peculiar morphology, and the spectrum as a width which is much broader than the other mechanism. And uh, even though this is a way to account for the 3.5 kV line. The 3.5 kV line is probably, probably from potassium. We will know in 10 years or so. So uh, this is something to look forward to. And maybe we will measure a line at 3.5 kV, which is much, much broader than what you expect from potassium or what you expect from neutrinos. And so this could be a, an answer. But the message I want to deliver is that this is something actually more general. It's a new way to produce X-ray lines. It's not solving or motivated by any other particle physics problem. It's just a model to account for dark matter. But it's something you can test. And I think it's a good time to 
also explore other possibilities besides the motivated candidates, as long as you can test and you can make progress excluding whatever you are suggesting. Thank you. More questions for Francesco? Yes. So I guess your answer that uh, uh, could it be that I want to get to are the first and the like as Mitrarima and next to like as Mitrarima and some supposed theory? Interesting, okay. Um, that is suggested to practice. Right? Uh, so the students are suggested. What? I thought about Susi, no, no, no. No, so uh, there are a few. The problem I see is that if you want. The, so, as, as I say, there is. Uh, let me go back to this equation, which. Uh, okay. This is a big problem. M chi suppresses the rate. So, if you go to higher mass, then you have less flux. So, I think you can have a light B, no? But if you have Q neutralini to be light, I think it's tough, right? Because you have charged states also. Can you divide the R pairing into any way to get the coupling to the, to the upscattering process? Why are pairing? No, 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 these are ah, both. Ah, yeah, 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 sorry. They're sorry. both are yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I think. Uh, sorry. No, if probably you are light because. Uh, Well, I mean, if I have two neutralinis, can you have two neutralinis in the 10 mb, 10 MB region? Q of them? Uh, because you, you know, then you have the charge partners that at least one will be around there. So maybe in the NMS, NMSSN, where you have the Bino and the Siglino, but then you have to explain why they are so close in mass, which I, I don't know if, uh, maybe, maybe there is a way, maybe uh, this is, why not? This is something that could be something to think about, yes, but at the moment I don't see an immediate way to do that. Yeah, sorry, I, I say that I want to suppress, I didn't say why. <laughs> because in this case it cannot be, right? Yeah, exactly, and also the last one. suppress the last scattering if it's uh, two or three. So, um, look at this uh, figure. Yeah. If you have the elastic, yes. you have a long range interaction with uh -huh. electrons in the mass region of uh, between MBV and GV. So here you already have direct detection bounds which are basically telling you that you are excluded. Now if you are inelastic, the mass splitting is large enough that you don't have any rate in direct detection. Yeah, I was thinking of direct detection, so yes. there's no way to... Direct detection, uh, we want to avoid that. There is, <laughs> so that. Why do we want to avoid direct detection? <laughs> well, because if uh, you go elastically, then you are excluded. That's why you want to avoid that, because the, you know, this is... Uh, this is a long range interaction, so the cross section for this is really large. And uh, if you don't suppress the elastic channel, uh, you so are. You are but we actually, we are, you know, we are uh, studying, this is part of the technology we are studying now, because even though you, be, you can be inelastic, you can have a loop diagram where you have few photon exchange, and then you, you end up uh, having a, a loop suppressed elastic scattering, which can still be can give meaningful bounds, or actually, sorry, you can uh, look for this in the future if you, this is a calculation we are doing, but if you show that having two photon exchange in a loop yes. gives you a one loop uh, direct detection per section, right. which is not excluded, but is within the reach of future experiment, that's another test you can have. So yeah, that's right, that's one loop contribution to direct. One loop. To elastic. To elastic, yes. The inelastic, just by kinematics, with you, when you scatter off electrons, there is no way you get anything. And of course, chi one is a dark matter, and you have checked the abundance of this chi one. Yeah. So in at least uh, this line, relic density. So you go through annihilation basically. In the early universe, you just uh, rotate this diagram, and you have chi one and chi two annihilating and uh, co-annihilating. Sorry, and uh, you said there is a standard calculation that you can decide. 